moment as I have been doing for a number of weeks and just provide uh, some encouragement. There's nothing more than, than we can receive than a little bit of encouragement and specifically uh, spiritual encouragement. Encouragement from the Lord, encouragement found in God's Word, um, identifying the lies that are all around us, the deceit that exists in our world, uh, exposed by the truth of what God says and who God is. So this past week, we've all walked in the midst of the world and its ways. If we went to work Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, whatever our work schedule looked like, we worked and walked in the world and it, in the midst of the world and its ways. Whether, whether we were working, whether we were at various events, social gatherings, whether it was on TV, whether it was social media, as we discussed weeks ago about our consumption uh, of, of social media and our phones, we have faced a world presenting an alternate story of the life that God intended. Not the true story of the life that God intended, but an alternate story, a deceit. Rather than hearing that we are God's children, loved by Him, accepted by Him, living in His grace, set apart, co-heirs with Christ, participating in His renewal of all things, we've been hearing things like this. You're not successful. Maybe we've not even been hearing them, but maybe we've been feeling them based on the expectations that have been placed on us or, or the, 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 whether they were felt or whether they were given to us. We've been hearing these kinds of statements. You're not successful enough. You're not productive enough. You're not skilled enough. You don't have enough money. You're not perfect parents or you weren't perfect parents. You're not loved or accepted. You're not the right color, size, shape. You're too old. You're too young. Or you'd be happier if fill in the blank would happen. Or if you had fill in the blank. You're not good looking. Or the opposite could be true. You're feeling very good looking. Because the opposite of all of these statements can be just as harmful. You're successful, productive, wealthy, all causing us to derive a sense of self-worth and value based on a worldly lens. Ultimately taking what was meant for God's glory in receiving glory for it. But here's what God says about those who believe in Him. These are the lies that we've been facing day in and day out. As I mentioned weeks ago, when we pull up our phone and we jump on Facebook or Instagram or wherever we tend to go, and maybe you don't go there, but you start to scroll, you're quickly reminded of what you don't have. You're quickly reminded of what you don't get to go and do, or you're not getting to go and do, or what you do or do not look like. You're constantly reminded of that. So here's what the, the Lord says about those who believe in Him. You are a child of God. You are fully loved and accepted by Him, and no one can take that from you. He has provided all that you need to live day by day. If you're His child, you wake up every day not in need, but being perfectly provided for each and every day. He knows what's on your mind. He knows what you've been through, what you are in, and what you are currently headed towards. But the truth is you are right in the midst of His grace. You are in His firm grasp. And nothing in this world, no circumstances that can come your way, can take you from that place. And for those who are lost, possibly in the room, know this, He is seeking you. He's seeking you. He's looking for you. And over the course of this message, He may be inviting you to join His family. And my prayer is that your heart, if you are lost this morning and you're in this room, my prayer is that your heart would be opened by the Word of the Lord, by the Spirit of God. So as we jump into this morning's text, I want to recap the last two weeks for just a moment. The last two Sundays, we've been looking at kind of a central theme of transformation. 
through our life spent with the Lord corporately, like we're in this setting right now. This is a corporate gathering of the body of Christ. So whether it was through our life spent with the Lord corporately or relationally, one-on-one, small group type settings uh, uh, where we gather with the people of God and individually, all of these particular moments spent with God, the Spirit of God is transforming us into the likeness of Christ. The Spirit of God is transforming us into the likeness of Christ. And so the first week a couple of weeks ago was renewal of the mind. That's the subject we were in, the, the famous passage in Romans 12, 2. The renewal of the mind leading to transformation. And then last week we looked at how the fear of man or ple- the, 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 the concept of pleasing man, how it can become a hindrance in our, transform, our transformational journey. Because when we are faced with a moment when we're going to choose whether to be obedient or faithful to what God asks of us or has commanded us or has, been, has convicted us of, in the moment that we have fear of what someone might think, fear of what someone might do, or someone might say, it's a hindrance in our spiritual journey. Aside from being a, fact, a, a matter of, of obedience and a matter of faithfulness, it's also a hindrance in our spiritual growth, our spiritual transformation. So this morning, I want us to look at another action in our lives that yet again plays a role in our spiritual transformation. Because I'm doing these, these particular messages and then beginning next week is when I'm going to begin a, a, a series of uh, I don't even know how many weeks it's going to go. Um, and I think the title is really going to be along the lines of Rediscovering Church. I really want to look at what is God's purpose for the church? What does Scripture say about His purpose for the church as a, as a body, as a group of people, as, as, it, as it gathers together in, in, a, in a corporate assembly like this one? Because there's all kinds of various thoughts and and concepts, or it may not even be something you've really ever even wrestled with. What is God's purpose? What is He doing through His church? And so I want to spend a few weeks um, digging into that. But this morning, we're looking at another action in our lives that plays a role in our spiritual transformation. So if you would, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 28. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, this morning we come before you with open hearts open minds, ready and willing to hear your word, to be transformed by the truth. I pray this morning that the Spirit of God would do the work that only He can do in illuminating the truth of Scripture in our hearts and in our lives, that we may be changed this morning, that we may be inspired this morning, that we may be encouraged this morning. Do the work only that you can do in our hearts and in our lives. And over the next few moments, I pray, God, that the words that come forth from my mouth, that they be born of your spirit, not of my flesh, that they edify your church, that they advance the kingdom, that they glorify you. Minister to us all in these next few moments. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard this particular passage probably more than once, specifically verse 31, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They, will, they, shall, they shall walk and not 
faint. And so this morning, I want to break this passage down into three parts. And the three parts I'm kind of c- considering these, uh, these categories or these parts, uh, I'm, I'm labeling them God's promise, our action, and God's nature. These are the three ways in which we're going to look at this particular passage. So first, let's look at the promise that's in this passage found in verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We've heard this many, many different times. Times. You've heard this passage, you've probably proclaimed this passage in your life. But what do these things actually even mean? What does it actually mean to mount up with wings like eagles? It's kind of an interesting thought, it's an interesting concept. What does that actually mean? So, first of all, there's the promise, the, the umbrella promise is this of, of this, that of renewed strength. God's saying he will renew your strength. For those of us who are tired, who are worn out, for those of us who've been battling this fallen world that wages war against our soul, the sickness, the death, the fruitless toil of work, contentious relationships, the Lord's offer to us is renewed strength, spelled out in these three illustrations. First being this, mount up with wings like eagles. He will renew our strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Ancient Hebrew culture revered eagles as mighty warriors, known for their strength and courage, especially in dangerous weather or dangerous circumstances. We see this imagery used in Exodus 19, recollecting how God delivered Israel. It says that you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Here's God delivering his people. So the promise to us, the Lord's promise to us is this. It will be as if you have wings of eagles to, wings of eagles to rise above turbulent times, elevated above destructive forces that are battling against your soul. It's this sense of a spiritual elevation out of the midst of physical trouble. Will you remain in physical trouble? Probably, maybe, maybe not. But those circumstances won't impact you. Those circumstances won't influence you. Why? Because you've mounted up with wings as eagles elevated above the turbulence that's going on, the trouble that's in front of you. To elevate above turbulent moments isn't this literal escape necessarily, but a sense of belonging to another kingdom, a transcendent hope that is not determined by the circumstances that are around us in this world. Have you ever felt those particular moments when the Lord gave you that kind of strength, brought you, you're walking through some of the darkest. I was, I was visiting with a brother uh, yesterday who was sharing me, with me some of the moments he's walked through in his life, and, and I just can't imagine uh, what that might feel like, some of the, the, the death and destruction that he's seen and that he's witnessed. But have you ever walked through a moment, or walked through a time where there was this sense of hope that you still had? The sense of, of, of joy that you were able to maintain in the midst of complete darkness, in the midst of complete confusion, when things didn't make sense. For me, this is what this giving these wings of like eagles and rising above this moment, this is what it means for my eyes and what I see this as. It's in this uh, elevation above the problems. And so then it says that we will run and not be weary. We will walk and not faint. First, it's worth noting that there's a difference between these words. Run and not be weary, walk and not faint. There's a difference between weary and faint. Where weary would mean for us to experience exhaustion because of the hardness of life, faint or become weak means failure through loss of strength. So there's a difference between these 
particular two words or concepts. So together, this, if you combine this to run and not grow weary, walk and not faint, together this means that God is giving us the strength to press forward in this life undeterred by the physical, mental, emotional, and relational hardship that we may face on this earth. To run and not grow weary, to walk and not faint, recognizing that hardship, turmoil, trouble, destruction is going to be part of our lives. For anyone who's ever been presented a gospel that says that that's not going to be part of your life any longer, that it's just going to be positive and everything's just going to go in your direction, I'm sorry to burst that bubble this morning. That is not what we're going to experience, nor is that what Scripture lays before us. That's not the life of the believer. Nothing, though, can wear down this divine inner strength that God is offering to us. This strength that He's offering, this mounting up with wings as eagles, running and not growing weary, walking and not fainting. And it's worth noting this order that these are in, because if you'll notice, it, it begins with this idea, this concept of soaring, this elevation, mounting up with wings as eagles. So it says that we will soar, then we will run, and then we will walk. Doesn't it seem like they would be the other way around? Maybe we begin walking, and then we start running, and then maybe we soar. At least when we think of an airplane, we think of it, you know, it kind of creeps along at first before it builds up some speed, before it takes off. But the truth is this. Once the Spirit of God helps us recognize that we are seated with Christ in the heavens, found in Ephesians 2, 6, for He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So once we recognize that we are seated with Christ in the heavens, then we are set on course, running the race set before us, found in Hebrews 12, 1, since we have since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so, that so easily ensnares. And then what? Let us run the race with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So once we are soaring, we, are, we recognize the Spirit of God has helped us realize we are seated with Christ in the heavens. The race has been set before us. We have endurance to run this race race, then what do we do? We're able to walk at the divine, unhurried pace of Christ, in Christ. Colossians 2, 6 says, as, there, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, what? So walk in Him. So when we soar, when we elevate, recognize, you know what? We're not citizens of this world. We're not inhabitants of this world. We're, we're, as Scripture calls us, aliens. We're foreigners in this land. So there's this race that's been set before us. Now we're running this race that's set before us, divinely in the hands of God, meaning that we can just walk at the slow, divine, unhurried pace of Christ. Who feels hurried oftentimes in their life? Like the pace just continues to, to press on and to press on and to press on. God's inviting us into this walking with Him at an unhurried pace. If, you, if you'll notice something about what God does through Scripture, what God's been doing through your life, is this. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry because you think he needs to be in a hurry or because there are circumstances or things going on in your life that you feel like need to be rushed along. What is God not in a hurry? He has a, a pace about him. He has a timing about him. We would be wise to recognize this and receive this offer. So God laid out this beautiful image here of receiving the necessary strength for this life. Because how many of you 
Does that sound like something you need in your life? The weariness, the tiredness, all that you're facing, all that you're combating in life, who would uh, enjoy some renewed strength? Who would enjoy the, this access to soaring like eagles? I'm above the problems and the turmoil of this life. They're not affecting me. They're not pulling me back. They're not holding me back. They're not taking anything from me. I'm running this race. I'm not growing weary. I'm able to walk at this divine, unhurried pace of, of Christ, and I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not growing weak because of it. Because I am, what? Seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. That is my place. That is my home. That is my inheritance. So there's this beautiful image we're receiving. But how do we get it? Which gets me to part two. So part one was this. Part one was God's promise. This was God's promise to us. Part two begins with our action. The necessary action to receive this renewed strength. It says this. They who wait for the Lord. They who wait for the Lord, found in verse 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. How many of us in the room like to wait? I think that's everyone's four letter, favorite four-letter word that begins with a W. I'll narrow it down there. Who loves to wait? Anyone in the room, they're just like, you know, that's my spiritual gift. I was just given this spiritual gift of waiting, and I love it. I don't know that anyone loves waiting. I remember one of my first experiences of moving to DFW. If you've ever, well, if you've ever driven there, you know it, but if you've ever lived there, it's a, it's a different story. I remember one of the first occasions in my life, this, this just shows you the small town that I grew up in, is I, I pull up at a, a stoplight, and it, it turns green. I'm back a, a little ways. It turns green. And it turns red again. So first it's red when I, when I get up there, and it turns green. But it turns red again before I get through it. Have you ever waited for two, through two red lights? That, that just that blew my mind, and it blew my, my patience. Uh, I, I, are you kidding me? Like I just sat here for a red light, and I got to the front, and I'm still two or three cars back. I'm going to have to sit here for another red light. Are you kidding me? So I quickly learned, living in that particular area, I was going to need to develop some patience if I was not going to go mad because it was quite the driving experience. But waiting is not our favorite action. It's not our favorite step. But time and time again, what is God asking us to do through Scripture? Not just asking us, but God commands us, encourages us, and exhorts us to wait on God. To wait on God. One of those examples that I think of waiting as well. And we have a couple of, of young mothers, part of the church right now, who experience this. Is the waiting of childbirth. From uh, conception to, to labor, this waiting period. There's nothing you can speed up about it. There's nothing you can rush along about it, can you? It just takes its time and it takes its course. And what's happening during that journey is growth is happening. Transformation is happening, both in the child and in the mother. There's transformation happening. There's growing that's happening. Nothing you can rush along, nothing you can speed up. You just have to wait on it. So probably our mothers in the room have this down a little bit better than us men. They know, hey, I, don't amen too loud there. But they understand this process of waiting, something to run its course, something to, to come to pass when it comes to pass. Because we don't love waiting. But time and time again, God's commanding us to wait. And God says for us to be able to receive the power of these promises, the way to renew our strength is, is by how? Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. But waiting. 
Does that mean sitting around doing nothing? Because that's the confusion that we can wrap up with the word waiting. Is that just sitting around? Like in a waiting room, what do we do? Uh, we grow impatient uh, in a waiting room. No, we wait. We wait. We sit there and we do nothing other than wait. So is this kind of waiting, doing nothing? No. I don't believe so. Maybe there's times, maybe there's moments, because I'm a big fan of, of there are moments God's inviting us into, into the simplicity of, of stillness and rest, recognizing that he's the Father, he's the all-powerful God, working out all things on our behalf. So there's times he's inviting us into moments of, yeah, just sit here and just wait on me. Wait to hear me, to listen for me, to acknowledge what I'm doing in the world around you. But ultimately, I think waiting is not just sitting still, but it also doesn't mean pressing forward in our own strength and wisdom. We have some examples in Scripture of some people who didn't wait on the Lord. What did they do? They pressed forward in their own wisdom and in their own strength. Because the reality is, yes, we are waiting on His timing, but we're also waiting on His will. We're waiting on His timing, we're waiting on His will, because it's very possible that we might be waiting around on something that God never desires for us to have, to do, or to become. There's things we might be waiting for that God's not actually ever going to do because it's not something He wants us to have, to become, or to be part of. That's exactly why it's important to understand that waiting on the Lord isn't inactivity. Because these next steps that I'm going to lay before us will reveal that if we were just waiting around doing nothing, we may never be revealed that, wait a minute, this isn't actually even God's desire for us. So in this waiting, it's not an inactive state. I believe that waiting is more of a posture of the heart and of the mind. It's more of us a, an inner posture to develop where we're waiting but not so much physically. So how should we wait? I want to lay out four ways that we should be waiting on the Lord. Number one is this. In our waiting, we should long for the Lord. David's writings often reveal right longing for God. Psalm 63 reads like this. O God, you are my God earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So in our waiting, we have a longing for the Lord. Longing for the Lord reveals this. It reveals, as we see in this particular uh, uh, passage by, by David, it reveals that he is our source of life, that he is our source of joy, that he is our source of hope, and that he is, he is our source of satisfaction. This longing for the Lord as we are waiting. So that's the first step. The first thing we do while we're waiting on the Lord is we long for the Lord. And the second is this. We listen for the Lord. Proverbs 8.34 says this, Blessed is the man that hears me watching daily at my gates, waiting, waiting at the posts of my doors. So we listen for the Lord. And listening for the Lord is remaining in this prepared state of active service. That's what this imagery portrays, this waiting at the gates for the master. To remain watchful at the gate for the words and for the activity of the Lord. So in our waiting, are we 
listening for the Lord? Are we watching for the Lord? Do we have time? Have we made time? Have we made space in our lives to listen for the Lord? That's why I invite us into times of stillness. I don't know if any of you in the moments we open service or other moments of your life where you just sit in stillness, where you feel like you've heard the Lord share something with you reveal something to you, remind you of a passage, remind you of a story or an instance in life for a specific purpose. If you're not making that time, I encourage you, make that time to hear from the Lord. Do we make that time and do we ask Him, Lord, what do you, what do you have for me to do? What do you want me to do? I'm, I'm waiting for maybe this thing that I think you want me to do, but what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be right now? Or this question, what are you already doing that I should go be part of? Oftentimes I find that we, as, as growing up in, in, the, in the, the circles I've grown up in, there's a lot of, of messaging, there's a lot of, of, of teaching around what is it that God has for me to do? What should I be doing? When I think more of the question should be, should be this, what is God already doing that he's inviting me to become part of? Less about my, my preference and my personal desire, but what is God already doing? Yeah, hey, maybe the opportunity for me to do my thing will happen one of these days, or I'll have this particular opportunity, but God, I want to be part of what you're already doing. I want my time and my resource and my effort to be involved with what you're already doing doing? What kind of unity might exist in the body of Christ rather than us having our own individual ministries and, 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 and desires and, and visions? If we, just, if we just said, you know what, for a moment, I'm just going to put a pin in those things, and I'm just going to jump into what the Lord's already doing. That's what I was inviting our seasoned adults into yesterday. Maybe we have ideas and projects or different things we could do. I'm inviting us into to contributing into the body of Christ here, our young people, our children, our teens, our young families. How do we all rally around, unite together, and contribute to this cause? Why? Because out of that, out of that work, when we get involved, that it, it might look like, why, well, why are we doing this? Why, the reason we're doing this is we're trying to, to raise up a healthy, mature, spirit-empowered believers inside of this room, because as we are empowered with, uh, with the Spirit of God, and we go forth from this place, we are, an, we are a mighty force to be reckoned with in our communities. We are a mighty force to be reckoned with in our cities, in our jobs, in our schools, in our families. But that's a product of some inner work that's being done inside this place, inside of our lives. The Word of God getting in us, the Spirit of God empowering us, and then compelling us to go and to live in Christ-likeness. So are we making this time to be with the Lord? So long for the Lord, listen for the Lord. We've got this beautiful L uh, uh, alliteration going on, so you're going to love this, just like churches do. Long for the Lord, listen for the Lord, look for the Lord. Sorry, not look for the Lord, look to the Lord. Long for the Lord, listen for the Lord, look to the Lord. Psalm 104, 27. Speaking of the animals and the beasts of the field, it says this, They all wait for you to give them their food when in due season. The animals of the field wait upon the Lord to give them their food in due season. The animal's natural instinct is just to wait on the Lord for their provision. They wait on the Lord for their provision in due season. So that's my question for us. Do we see the Lord in that way? That He is providing us our provision in due season. He is opening whatever doors necessary in due season. He is moving in His perfect will and timing in due season. Do we trust that? Are we looking to the Lord as our provision? Do we look to Him as our source and our supply? 
not to anyone else, but to him. In our waiting, we look to the Lord. We acknowledge our dependence on him. We recognize that he is providing all that we need when we look to him. So we long for the Lord. We listen for the Lord. We look to the Lord. And then the last one is we live for the Lord. We live for the Lord. As Romans 12, 2, 12, 1 says, we read it weeks ago, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Are we living for the Lord? To use our time, our energy, our resources as a way to bring glory to God. Is this the way we're living? To properly live for the Lord. This includes stewarding what's in front of us. So that the day when the master returns, we hear those desired words, well done, good and faithful servants. Something I shared, uh, I think, for just a moment yesterday. When I think of stewardship and, and I think about the, the particular story uh, where, where the master's returning and, and seeing what the servants did with the, the, what they were entrusted with. I think about where does that stop in our lives? Where does the stewardship stop in our lives? What has God entrusted to our, to our stewardship and to our care? Are these just our resources? Is this just our time? Is it just ourselves? Or does this extend outside of ourselves? Is this the relationships that are in our lives? Has God divinely placed the people in this room, in our lives, as part of our stewardship? Do we have a responsibility to steward the relationships in this room. That's what I was thinking of when I was thinking of us, uh, uh, or the, the seasoned adults, uh, ministering to, to young children. Did God, did God divinely place these moments in place as an opportunity for us to steward these young souls and these young lives as the family of God, as the seasoned adults of this particular community? So to properly live for the Lord means stewarding what's in front of us. I think that's so often a, a, a needed message when we're waiting on the Lord. I want the Lord to do this. I need him to do this. I think he should be doing this. Why is this not happening? Well, what's he want me to do next? No, what's in your hand right now? What's in your life right now? Who's in your life? I've had people talk to me, I want to do ministry. I want to, I want to be this. I want to be this. Who are the people in your lives right now, and how are you stewarding that? How are you ministering to those people? Because God's already entrusted you with some ministry. Are you stewarding it well? And if you're not, why would he entrust you with more? That's my question. So we long for the Lord. We listen for the Lord. We look to the Lord. We live for the Lord. This is part of our waiting process. This is what we're doing while we're waiting. Does this speed up the process? Does this move God's hand into action for us? No, I don't believe it does. But it does indicate this particular truth in our hearts. When we sit in this waiting and we practice these particular four uh, uh, actions in our life, Here's what it indicates about us, that we trust. It indicates that we trust the Lord when, we, when we're willing to, to wait and just be faithful with what he's called us to do and what he's placed in front of us. It means that we're able to, we trust that God is working things out. We trust that he's working things out in his good and perfect timing. So it indicates our trust, and, and then the third part of this particular passage as I break down uh, the passage here is why should we trust the Lord? If here's this trust being, being asked of us to wait on the Lord, to wait on His timing, to wait on his, his will, to wait on what He's going to do in and around our lives, why should we trust the Lord in this way? Isaiah helps us here. When we get to part three, we see God's nature. Why can we trust God? Why can we embrace the unknown, the unanswered prayers, the long waiting periods? 
Why are we able to do that? Isaiah reveals this in the opening of this passage. Starting in verse 28, he says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Listen to that image that's painted of our God. He is everlasting. He is creator to the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Then it's revealed his generous heart for his people. What does it say he does? He gives power to the faint and increases the strength of the weak. Further on up, if you go back up into chapter 40 a little bit further, we also see this. We see that he is the God of might. In Isaiah 40.10, it says, Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. He's the God of wisdom. In Isaiah 40.13, it says, Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? And then we see God, the God of tenderness. In Isaiah 40, 11, it says, He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. The prophet Isaiah does a masterful job at presenting the nature of God, which should instill in us a confidence, a trust in the Almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God. So why can we trust him? Isaiah reveals this for us. This is the God that we serve, full of power, full of might, full of wisdom, but also full of care, the tenderness of God caring for his people. We serve a good and perfect father. He's full of power, understanding, wisdom, love. And what is, he ask, what is he telling us how we have access to this? How we have access to what it is? All we've got to do is this. Wait on him. Wait on him. Long for him. Listen for him. Look to him. Live for him. All while we're waiting for God to work out in his perfect timing. I like how... One commentator put this idea of waiting, and I saved it towards the end because I, I like this particular framing of this idea and this concept of waiting on the Lord. And he put it this way, he says this, to wait like this is to rest trustfully in the Lord. To rest trustfully in the Lord. To remain in this state of rest where we know that this, we have confidence in this almighty, all-powerful, loving, wise Father. Even when our, His ways don't make sense to us. Even when we can't understand what's happening. I, I, can, I can name countless stories I've heard. People in this room can have countless stories that they could, they could uh, retell about their lives where it doesn't make any sense at all. Where it looks like God may be completely absent from what's going on. That's why we need these words of Isaiah. That's why we need this confidence to know this is who our God is. Good and perfect. Fully wise. But he's also the creator. The timeless God who's, who was there in the... He's, somehow, he's outside of the bounds of time. He is there in the past, in the present, in the future. All at one time. So for just for a moment, we think of a God who is that God. Can we trust him? Can we trust him in the waiting? Can we trust a God who sees the beginning, who sees the end, who knows yesterday, but he also knows tomorrow? When I think of that often, I think of how arrogant that I am so often. I think of how prideful that I am. When I think of a God who knows that much and how... Uh, confidently I approach things 
or think, think I have the, the intelligence or the intellect or the ability to, to just, or just even, hey, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and here's what I'm going to go and do. I'll do that if the Lord wills it. I'll do that if that's in accordance with His timing and His will and His purposes. What a mighty God that we serve. So we rest trustfully in the Lord. We trust in His goodness, and we trust in His timing, and we trust in His purposes. Habakkuk 2.3 says this, God's promises, I'll let you pull that up, Habakkuk 2.3, because this is a really great verse for anyone in this particular season. God's promises and God's purposes will surely come to pass. They will not delay, not in the end. So this morning, rest trustfully that God is working in the waiting. That God is working in the waiting. And that in the end, you will have received all that was needed to faithfully live and serve Him for all of your days. We will see that everything needed to experience fullness of joy and an abundant life was available to us. It was available to us. It is available to us. One day we'll be revealed that. One day we'll understand that that was. No matter what we think here that we need or that God's not doing for us, that He's not giving for us, what we deserve, or why, isn't, why wouldn't He want me to have this? One of these days, it'll all make sense. But for now, we trust in the goodness of the Father the perfection of the Father, working all things out in His perfect timing and according to His purposes and His good pleasure, because He is the Creator. So the action this morning remains up to you and I in this question. Will we wait upon the Lord? Will we rest trustfully that God is working in this season of waiting? Stand with me, if you would, as we close. Bow your heads for just a moment. Father God, I pray that your word has planted a seed within us this morning. I pray that it was revealed to us, God, your, your, your access to renewed strength, your access to walk through this life full of your power and your strength. Help us in our waiting. Help us as we wait for you, God, that we don't uh, neglect you. We don't uh, um, look away from you, God, but that we trust you fully and that we look to you, we listen for you, that we long for you, and that we will live for you in this season of waiting, God. We ask that your Spirit would give us the patience, give us the ability to wait to do what you want to do in our lives, in our community here at this church, Lord. We embrace this patient season. We embrace the waiting of what you want to do in our church, what you want to do in our lives, what you want to do in our families. We trust in your goodness. We trust in your power. We trust in your wisdom. We know that you are working all things out for your good, Father. We trust that this morning, Lord. Strengthen us this morning as we wait. Give us the, the, the confidence. Renew in us that, that strength, Lord, that you've offered to us. May we walk in obedience. Fill us this morning with your spirit, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we leave this morning, I want to remind everybody next Sunday evening, 5 o'clock, is family table. It's going to be chicken-themed, so bring a chicken dish of your preference. 5 o'clock at the other building. We hope that everyone... Um